trying to figure out to understand. But I'm still in the picture if I am not blind by the way. So thanks all for coming. Um, yeah, the, um, Andreas asked me to maybe talk a bit about the work planner. And I give the subtitle of you know, converting documents for fun and profit. And actually it's kind of a lie, and you already told me out about it, there's no profit in there. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I made it for a good title. Well, I got my bachelor's degree for converting documents with fun documents. Yeah. Not just, but he was a part of the process. <laughs> Is it paying already? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, I also thought you can actually turn a profit if you use it to can convert documents. That's my turn a profit. So, so let's see. Um, maybe first, kind of, to, for me to get a feeling who is here, like, who, who knows Pandor? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, who has used Pandor? Can you the comment on? Quite a few already. And has anyone used even Pandoc the Haskell library? Okay. So, so yeah, I, I was kind of unsure um, how much to talk about, like just using it as the main line tool, and how much use it and the more talk about the Haskell side of things. Um, so, yeah, just interrupt me when you want to more when you want to know more about some specific parts. Um, it's also a fairly like interactive talk, like I'm going to do some stuff in the command line and we can expand on some stuff more and we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so first quick intro, um, in case you didn't know, why Pandoc is the pan universal document converter, um, because it converts from all formats to almost all formats. Um, it's yeah, it's command line utility as well as a Haskell library that uses uh, the, uh, the command line utility is implemented as a Haskell program that uses the library. And we'll see what that means. At first, there's this graphic that used to be like on the front page on the end of the door, um, but then it kind of grew and grew, and so now it's somewhere at the bottom, but it still exists. <laughs> Yeah, you can see where this is going. <laughs> so on the left there are the input formats, and on the right there are the output formats, and there is some fix magic, I guess, that connects <laughs> all of them. And yeah, we'll, we'll see how that's even possible. Um, maybe some some background. I, I didn't invent Pandoc at all. Um, the main developer is John McFarlane, and he is still the, the lead developer and and um, he is really, I have never met him unfortunately yet. Um, but he is, uh, his main, main job is, he's a professor of philosophy, interestingly, at UC Berkeley. And I guess he can be here just on his spare time, or I, I don't know, maybe if he's in a boring meeting, he hacks away on Pandoc. <laughs> I don't know how he does it, but he does a lot of awesome work. Yeah. And he started it, I looked it up in October 2006. So that, that's in Kim, that's quite a long time ago. Like GitHub was founded in 2008. Um, to put it in context, so it started on Google Code. <laughs> For those people that still remember that. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, now it's posted on GitHub. Um, and so how, how did I get involved in Pandoc? Same story. <laughs> I had to write a bachelor's thesis. <laughs> and started using it, and then, yeah, soon enough I found it. Yeah, we could make some improvements. And somehow I've always found a little bit of time, yeah, every once in a while, sometimes more, sometimes less, to contribute some patches, or, or that can also moderate a bit on the issue track to see that it, and the issue can be closed, um, because they're using an old version. <laughs> Uh, or whether there's actually a bug report there. Um, one thing I find really nice about Pandoc is that it's quite a newbie friendly code base in terms of Haskell projects. <laughs> and also the community is quite friendly. Um, so, yeah, I, I can really recommend um, if you have an issue, just um, maybe ask around if you're unsure on the Pandoc Discuss mailing list, which is quite active actually, although it's still um, hosted on Google Groups. <laughs> so some people think, think it's like that because it's on Google Groups, so 
Actually, it's quite accurate. And if you're not sure it's an issue, then you'll just make an issue or make a pull request. Um, yeah, so let me think about every, everyone. Um, yeah, but I'm going to see how, how, how in detail we'll go. I mean, on, on the really the easy part is that you you launch family without arguments, and the default is it goes from has to have from markdown to 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 HDR. And if you don't give any further arguments, it's just like sitting there waiting for for input on the standard thing. And you just tell me if you cannot see this. Um, and yeah, so, so this is a file in markdown. And then you can get control V and it will just spit it out in the standard output again. And um, that's quite nice for testing stuff. You can um, do it like this. Um, and yeah, I guess most of you know this. You can do different things. <laughs> and so yeah, I think I'm going to skip the most basic part since you almost all have used it before. Um, hey, who, who knows about kind of templates? Should I talk about that? Ah, oh, awesome. I can only skip the first point. Um, and, or maybe just for completeness, you can do from markdown to basic and it's the same. And, 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 and who knows about common mark? Um, Okay, awesome. So there was the, the thing with Markdown, it's kind of it's a really nice syntax. I think in terms of it's um, the philosophy is kind of whatever you would write in a plain text email, you, you just dump it in there. And you and it's really readable if you, if you have a document. Um, like, like actually I can this this slide for this talk um, are in this directory as well. And you can put some um, YAML front matter in there. And so it's kind of title, subtitle. And this will actually be converted to, to, a, to a bullet list um, in, in an ordered list in, in um, HTML and in LaTeX. It does this weird stuff that I never want to type myself. <laughs> That's why I use Panda. <laughs> um, but the, the, the typographic output is actually um, um, quite nice. So you can also write to a file, of course. Um, let's see. I think I'm supposed to write tag, and it will automatically figure out that the tag means I want to do uh, dot to to latex. Um, it has created this file, uh, but I can can also do directly to PDF, and it's actually calling PDF latex. That's the default if you have it installed, and create those beautifully typeset documents. You can imagine that's the nice part about latex. Right? Um, So maybe talk. Let's talk about about templates. Um, so if you do, do this, that's HTML, all right. But if you would put this into an HTML validator, it would complain lots of things because there is missing a lot of stuff. And your tool is use the standalone flag. Standalone or S for short, and then it will actually produce the whole document starting with doc time, HTML and whatnot. And yeah, put some, some even some minor CSS in there and there's your little thing. This is actually too far if you go. Probably too fat like that. Um, 
And so the question is kind of where does the stuff around the document fragment come from? And the answer is the template. And you can actually look at the template. Um, so I think it's capital D for default template, I guess. And you can give the, the, the format, and it will print the default template. And you can also um, like just Unix file this to a file, right, and start editing it. And there are all those dollars in there that actually get replaced um, <coughs> by those metadata variables. Um, can, can you see this cursor here? This is a thing pointing to it. Um, and, and if the input format is markdown, that's the YAML metadata. But you could also set it in various um, other ways, like metadata, date, equals, yeah, it's not a date, but let's say the kind of templating language is not strongly typed, even <laughs> though it's implemented in Haskell. Um, yeah, let's see if I actually get this right. <laughs> but, so if I do this and open. So there should be an E at the end of the date, so I can have a date. Ah, thank you. I thought I already did so many mistakes. So you see, like this is not good because I forgot the dash s, which is like a very common error. Um, yeah, it's even a warning now that you haven't <laughs> specified the title, so it will actually not be valid HTML. But um, I don't care. So, what did that five foot? custom template here, so I might not have taken <laughs> Yeah, my bad. But you can imagine that it should work. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, so, yeah, if you hide this um, to, to, to somewhere, then you can, of course, modify it as well, the template, and, and even use this um, like this, and it will do what you expect. And if you if you often use the same template, I can put this in here, I think. Uh, oops. Ah, yes, there it is, my custom template. And then it will just use this um, inside in here. Which is sometimes surprising. But all the time, it's quite nice. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there are like different templates that are quite nifty sometimes, like have lots of ifs and, and for loops even. Um, and so the goal is kind of that you don't <coughs> necessarily need to modify the template. That's why there are lots of variables in there. <coughs> which you can just specify um, and then you kind of don't need to fork the template but it's kind of the first escape patch if you're like no, and it doesn't do the output that I want then you can just kind of fork the template and yeah, sometimes you may, maybe if there's a new kind of version you need to update it and that's the disadvantage but oftentimes you're like fine with it um, so one amazing thing is you can actually save a Word document and use that as a template, which is insane. And it does the math formulas right. So if you like have to do that at work, which is very annoying, you can write your entire... I once wrote, I don't know, a gazillion page of documentation in Markdown, but I only had Word at work, but I was able to use time. It was so great. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so you can save the styles, right? Like of the headers, 
and uh, you can say the styles of the lists and like anything, colors and fonts, and, and then you can just use those templates. Yes. Yeah. So, so, um, explicitly in the command line. So this is the, if you go to pandoc.org slash manual, um, there is like this huge <laughs> lengthy document, if you can see that. I'll scroll over to the right, which is kind of getting out of hand, but we can really split up, because otherwise all the links break. And it's also <laughs> nice that you can just do command F and start searching on it. And there is a section about templates that kind of tells you what, we, what I just told you. And so there is a nuance kind of um, that for verbs it's not a template because a template needs to be plain text, plain text for the kind of um, templating engine to interpolate the scholar thing. And of course, for binary formats um, like Word or ODP, um, that doesn't really quite match um, because actually a Word document is a zip container. Um, just some. I can actually do this. Um, how does it work? Unzip, directory, whatever. And there's 
some of them, but there are two you don't want to know about and you don't want to put in your templates. <laughs> and yeah, if you're like really gross and or want to debug that kind of issue that someone says something is wrong, you quickly learn that actually the only proper file in there is the document XML file. It's not getting any better in there. <laughs> So, what you would do is oops, oops, um, use this reference doc, um, standard option, which you use for work on the OED output and probably also a few other binary output forms that I can't remember. Um, or maybe actually I'm not thinking of the documentation. Yeah, PowerPoint. There's a PowerPoint way, right? But that comes from contributed a couple of months ago. And so what you do there is you basically put in kind of a Word file and that you opened in Word and you edited the styles in there in Word. Um, then you kind of detect the pen log in the tool or try to kind of <coughs> yeah, replace the document XML in there, I guess and leave the rest more or less unchanged. That's probably simplified, <laughs> but that's the gist of it. Um, usually it actually surprisingly works well. You can, you're supposed to kind of generate this reference topics uh, somehow with some kind of command, then open it in, in Word, change the styles and use it. Yeah. But the first gotcha works. All other output formats templates, of course. And yeah, since we are talking about words, that's kind of a cool use case that you can actually also use it as an input form. So, so the, the, the only an unnamed argument to Pandoc is the input file, which is also kind of surprising sometimes. <coughs> And that also means that you cannot um, specify multiple input files, which is kind of bad in a way, but it also maps neatly to the fact that you can just type some input into Pandoc, so those two behaviors are the same. So, so for, for Markdown, you could actually specify like several um, files kind of, but what this would do is it would use your bash to concat or your whatever shell <coughs> to can concatenate those two files and then pass it to Pandoc, um, which usually works out okay unless you're on Windows, I think, then your shell is like, you know, <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> and then you can write some other for loop in whatever language they use to do bash, so to say. Yeah. I'm sorry, if you like Windows. <laughs> there are good parts of it as well. <laughs> um, what I was saying that, yeah, I was actually just trying to use the, 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 the word reader, and then you go like, let's look what this look, would look like in HTML. It's like, it worked. It would even work as a file that was produced with Word and not with Spender. <laughs> But I can demonstrate this and I don't have work. Um, and then the next question usually people have. So what if I send this word file, right? I generate it to some word person and they use this word feature that kind of does this, I mean, what is it called? You propose changes kind of, and there are those red thingies if you open it in Word and green thing is, and you can say, yeah, I want to merge kind of this um, change request. I'm sorry, I'm using Git terminology here, yeah. whatever it's called in Word. Um, and you can actually do this uh, somehow. Let me think the, what is the option in um, uh, Blindly because you trust your fellow <laughs> co authors, or we check all of them. And you are not with us. That. And oh, it's an interesting 
something, ah, for safety. Mm -hmm. Because some, some, something small. It says it looks like. Okay, what does it say? It just rules it up. It says if it's in. Puts it in search terms, deletions, and comments, reference, pens, red pockets. Mm. Yeah, that's useful. And then, yeah, we can do stuff with it. Mm. Yeah, I'll cover later, I guess. I'm looking. Ah, yeah, and, and that's also a nice demo. It's like another nice thing of from LaTeX, apart from the typography, is that you can actually write math that doesn't suck. And so, Panda um, does this as well. And let me see. So, ah, I've already prepared this to double escape the, the backslashes because mm -hmm. that's what dash does, I think. And let me need to double escape the. Um, well, this actually does what I think it does, yes. So when you're actually passing in, it's only one pixel. Um, cool ATEC is kind of unsurprising. Well, yeah, it uses like backslash um, braces instead of dollar, but I think that's configurable. And since we were talking about verb, Dun, dun, dun. It's like actually doing magical stuff. It <laughs> works. It, it would even work in proper verb. <laughs> Not in pages. <laughs> Trust me. And you could um, edit this in this formula editor that word uses. If you want to do that, I guess. <laughs> and so, an other interesting case is HTML. Um, it's like already outputting a warning saying, yeah, HTML doesn't really do math. You're just kind of going to fake this, I guess. Um, but what you can do is use the math checks or however that's pronounced flag to say, I actually want to embed a math checks, which is a JavaScript library that goes all through the document and it converts LaTeX math to, I think you can configure it, and the default is might be SVG, possibly. Possibly it also uses a lot of CSS, like, I'm actually not sure. Because usually, kind of works, surprisingly. Uh, also, I'm proud of the JavaScript. <laughs> How do I get out of here? <laughs> so yeah, that was the. Uh -huh. Maybe you need the whole document template so that it could script that. You need to yeah. serve it and not access it as a file. Oh, that problem. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think if you do like standalone, it will include the JavaScript that you need. I uh, uh, did I forget this again? Yes. I Thank you. Um, it's already better now. Um, <laughs> okay, but, but yeah, I think you'd have to, to uh, make it still. Sorry. <laughs> Connected to internet? No, I'm not. <laughs> I, um, but I. Uh, let's see. Is it by default? Oh, because it's not. Yeah, yeah you're right. So that's what it says. Yeah. So that, I guess it's time to try um, self something and other. And it's my oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was the part where I was like, I might use internet because it would actually have found like, the file and include it and usually it even escapes everything properly. And yeah, you already see the first part of Haskell leaking through. <laughs> or better or worse. But yeah, um, it would work. <laughs> <Trust> <laughs> This is going to be the theme. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, maybe if you have some, some, some questions about Pandoc as a um, command line unit utility, you can ask them now, and otherwise, that kind of the second part is like kind of look at the Haskell internals a bit more. Um, yeah, I'm just going to continue with the 
as to internal motion. In that case, and we will see how, how much time we have in the end for discussion. How, how much time do we have? Till nine or, or half past eight, somewhere in between there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, still, there's like lots of things we can still do. Um, so let's talk about uh, the Haskell side of things. How, how the basic architecture and of how how Fenwick is implemented um, <coughs> is that you, you have some input, yeah, either from standard room or profile, and you can force it with the um, dash f or dash dash from flag, and that from flag actually one on one. So that was usually um, markdown before or you know, whatever, and so that string corresponds one on one to a Haskell module that's called a reader. So if you do dash f HTML, it will actually call the HTML, um, yeah, the HTML reader. And then there is the in intermediate document ASD, um, which is just a plain. Actually, I'll show you what it is. It's this thing. Oh, just a plain Haskell, quite ordinary um, 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 abstract uh, algebraic data type. And then from there, it calls a writer, which is a module again, specified with the two flag, which you kind of detected from the extension. And then it outputs the stuff either to send it out or, or the file. And you can also output EPUB, for example, and then it does some fancy stuff and zips it or, yeah, blur it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that kind of, that's really the great decision um, John McFarlane did in the beginning, I think. Um, so everything goes through this central place, the ASD with the document ASD, <coughs> which kind of explains the, the image I showed you in the beginning with all the errors and of how it's even possible. Well, yeah, it's kind of cheating. It would have to go actually to the ASD, and then there would be a lot fewer errors if you don't connect all the input and output formats. And that's kind of how um, and John and, and his um, fellow contributors like myself kind of keep this whole thing working. And it, of course, comes out kind of with the limitation that everything has to go through here. So it means Fender cannot really deal with documents that are not representable in this data structure. So that's a, a subset of all yeah, possible input and output forms, of course. But it kind of maps almost one on one to Fender flavored markdown. So if you input, um, Input markdown, uh, then you kind of get a, almost a one on one conversion to here. And so that's kind of, yeah, kind of a privileged input format, I would say. But there are also tons of people using kind of this input format, like org mode or RST, like restructured text and, 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 and LaTeX, because people love like backslashes and curly braces. Um, yeah. Maybe there are better reasons. There's also like the reason that you might want to use PDF LaTeX directly from LaTeX, kind of, to do all your typography type setting things, and then you just use kind of to go from LaTeX to 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 HTML, and that usually turns out fine. Um, so, so yeah, maybe a quick look at the, this. Um, algebraic data type. So this is a simplified version of what you would find in this module, um, which actually lives in the end of types repository. And the reason for that is that you can then use, um, like in a Haskell project, friend, like build a structure that uh, that builds an instance of this ASD. Um, without requiring the whole of Pandoc, which has quite a few dependencies, let's put it mildly. Um, but you can then just into Pandoc types. So just to be aware of it's a set, it's the only separate repository, so you can find it in Pandoc types. 
<coughs> and it's fairly like straightforward. Bender consists of the metadata, which kind of corresponds to the YAML metadata in the markdown um, document, and the list of blocks. And the block is, for example, a paragraph or a bullet point list, like I showed you a header. And actually, there are tons more. But the interesting thing is that a paragraph consists of a list of inlines, um, and the header also contains a list of inlines. And the inline is, yeah, what you'd expect if you know HTML inline elements. It can be just plain string, or it's emphasis, like italics, or strong, which is bold, or it's a link, or it's an image or quite a few other things. But, so yeah, that's kind of the underlying uh, magic that everything goes through. Mm. So, yeah, so um, the header has an int in there, is that the level of the heading? So it's not sound in this like uh, hierarchy, but you just have a level of heading. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I think like when John wrote this, um, there weren't like the HTML5 um, nested kind of headings yet. <laughs> so it was just H1, H2, and I think it goes up to 6. <laughs> and we actually go up to 2 to the power of 64, I think, so that's better. <laughs> and so you can see from this that it's kind of a fairly straight. Um, it's also like yeah, there's still string in there instead of text. Um, there's like a long standing issue to fix that. Um, no one's really kind of, should be a fairly mechanical transformation, but um, yeah, some bit of work. And it's also a list instead of sequence. Um, yeah, I think at the point when Thunder wrote those, uh, when John wrote those couple of lines, the text didn't even exist yet. Uh, I'm not 100% sure that's the case. Um, fairly certain sequence didn't exist yet. <laughs> um, but kind of, yeah, because everything goes through this ASD change here is always, yeah, um, takes with it a lot of changes in all the readers and all of the writers potentially. And even in fact, kind of filters, let's like, see that I can talk, yes. That's <laughs> Just a question regarding the AST. Does it provide for any support for tables? Uh, yes. Um, let me see if I can do it. Yeah. This is the wrong repository. Let's see that I can get. Can quickly show the whole file. Um, You see, copyright 2006. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, there are a bunch of things exported and there are a bunch of imports, and that's the first interesting file I showed you. And then there are, yeah, instant semi group monoids. Kind of, and yeah, the, actually, the meta is even, yeah, um, it's a map from string to meta value, which is. Um, already better um, at kind of a list of, of tuples of string to string, which we have in other places for uh, historical reasons. <laughs> and maybe one, one day there's something that's going to be changed, hopefully. Um, and there are a bunch of helper functions, a um, bunch of more data types, but here is kind of yeah, like the actual block type. Okay. So you can see there's a few more things in there. There's a table. Um, it's basically a list of list of cells. And there's a header row. And there is the width of the columns as mm -hmm. doubles. And the alignments of the columns and the caption. Um, you can already see that not every HTML table is representable in this thing. Mm -hmm. For example, you cannot do 
will stand and call things and mm. there's no issue about that. Might get implemented at some point because kind of yeah. There was a lot of debate there about like dependent sites and wouldn't it be really nice <laughs> to um, <laughs> like only be to like stuff that's representable. Like, mm. kind of, if you can represent it in the ASD, then it should always output a valid table kind of in HTML and all the formats. Mm. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm. Kind of yeah, what yeah, what do you do if not all rows have the same mm. length? And even worse, what if this list this hasn't the same length as this list and this list? Mm. And of course this would should never happen. <laughs> Um, but so that's what, one of the reasons why this issue has been open for so long because we've debated it for a long time. But I think we're just going to stick with a list of lists, but make kind of roll these two in there. So oh, we'll see. If you have good ideas, feel free to pitch in <laughs> and scroll to the bottom <laughs> and start reading from there <laughs> instead of the other way. Um, Yes, yeah, so and maybe since this file is already open, let's have a quick mm -hmm. look um, at the, the inline types. So there are quite a few things more there. Mm -hmm. So, for example, math was just implemented as a string, which is a text string, latex string, which works nicely for latex and math checks. And, yeah, of course, also where it needs to be converted. What is math type? Say again? Yeah, math type. The math type. Not just display online, is it? Yes. You know, you know this code thing. It was there. Yeah. I <laughs> just threw it through. Yeah, and there are then all oh, like all those interesting debates, kind of, which you probably might have, or you might know from HTML, like what should go to CSS, kind of the styling presentational stuff because that's always a great excuse we tend to just say we don't use it it shouldn't go in with the ASD but then kind of yeah small caps hmm isn't this kind of a styling thing yeah maybe so it's kind of a blurry line <laughs> um, yeah and another interesting thing is the spam which is general purpose uh, inline thing, like in HTML, just takes this attribute and the, the, the block the block element has a corresponding thing that's called the, the, the diff, um, which is a general purpose yeah, information. And so you can always kind of use those to hack your stuff in. And yeah, so the attribute, let's see if I find on this. It's, yeah, that's the one I was talking about. It's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the good thing is you can put anything in there and it will survive the transformation and you can do small things with it. And yeah, so this is the ID, the list of classes. And another outstanding issue is that this should be added kind of to all, or it might be, Maybe it should be added to all, because currently, for example, you cannot do attach attribute to the block code, right? But of course, historical reasons, it's not there. But maybe I should quickly switch back to kind of filters, because that's exactly why you want to use those things. Um, who knows kind of filters? Okay, I should talk about it. So, can you even read this? There's this even, um, funny um, writer or um, outperformant, Jason. And what it does is it kind of drops the whole ASD we saw as a JSON format. And that's useful because then you can put your custom program in there. You can put a panda filter in there. And panda filter is just any program that understands this JSON output. And the, the, I think the only filter that's bundled with Pandoc is Pandoc Sideprop, which does really awesome magic for um, citations. Um, 
across multiple output formats and it even outputs proper latex citations. And what it does, it kind of changes the ESD and does some transformations on there and outputs JSON again and then you can use pandas again, read from JSON, which is the JSON reader, um, which is like a one line somewhere, I think. And then you just do the usual thing. And because that's kind of that's how it works, but it's kind of verbose. So there's the dash dash filter flag where you can um, just put in a command line and get to the, the name of the program and Pandoc will call this just as you would have done the first time. So I, I mentioned before that kind of templates are the first cascade patch if you want to customize the output, but templates only allow you to customize the, the stuff that's around the document properly, around the document fragment. <coughs> right, so, yeah, we see that. But what if you want to change kind of stuff inside of the document? And that's what kind of filters are for. And so you can imagine it's very powerful, so that's why you might want to use the stands and the diffs I mentioned previously, because then you can create a diff with a class, um, I don't know, maybe warning, and then you can write kind of filter that kind of matches on that diff and transforms it to some reddish HTML, maybe, or, or for HTML it's kind of neat, you don't really need to, to do anything, it will just pass through the class and you can match on it with CSS if that's enough. Um, Maybe you would want to create a document that has only the warnings for people who don't like reading one document and then you could use it for it. You could also do that with CSS, but it's a little bit, you know, the better example maybe. Yeah, you, you can do um, a lot of stuff. Um, let me see, but I, I think I have to prepare some more. Um, yeah, this, so this is a really basic filter. Um, written in, in Haskell even and so it, it matches on all inline elements um, in this string here you might remember it from the, the oh, so, um, so this matches actually on this constructor here right so it just and um, then you just say yeah I want to transform this stuff to uppercase and since it's a string, we use map, mm -hmm. do you think? And for all the rest, you just pass it through as is, and that will not modify all the other inline elements that you encounter. And that you could already drop all caps to the to JSON filter function here, and I think that should work. And what the to JSON filter function does is kind of convert this to an IO that he serializes the JSON you receive and serializes it back to JSON and, and walks you through it, through, walks you through the process through the whole ASD. And you can also do that manually with the walk function, which you can import from that kind of walk. And, and, and so we, yeah, you can. Can you quick show the type of the two JSON filter? Um, that's probably a fairly polymorphic type of thing. Oh. Where does this thing come from? So that's the part where the no internet thing bites me. Because I don't have Google installed, I think. Do you want internet? Uh, uh, I think it's just I don't know, I can Thank you. 
good, good um, point in time to talk about um, when did I just see this? Um, um, together 
load the JSON file. Um, in case you actually have a proper JSON file, filter by those credit cards, call your create ledger function from above, and then you have a append of document which is called ledger git. So what do you do instead? Used to be a time where you could just call write.git and use the default instance for some options which you can set on readers and writers and then pass in the document and that would be it. But since pandoc 2.0, you have to put it into run IO. And so this is a um, type class as well, um, which you have to implement two functions, run PR and run IO. And the use case for that is that the command line utility always calls run IO, and usually that's what you want to do. But say you are implementing a website, maybe a wiki, or more a content management system or something. Of course, you do that in Haskell. And then you have untrusted user input coming in. Um, maybe they write your stuff in Markdown, in your users. Um, you probably don't want them to have access to your server's local file system. So that's where run pure comes in. Um, it's kind of neat. Then you, I mean, you lose a few features, of course, like, yeah, including external documents, which you might be able to do otherwise. Um, yeah. And then you, you can use this handle error that brings just an out if you encounter an error. And finally, this will already contain the binary byte string of the zip topics and then you just write that to the file and hand it over to your boss. And I think I can I might be able to demonstrate it. Um, yeah, I think it worked once. So, um, what is this called? The building thing. And yeah, I already have the image in this directory. And because I was using Spectre, I did a quick cabal file in the Spectre.yaml file. Yeah. But now I can. <coughs> No errors, and then I can run this whatever it's called. And, oh, what is it? I know I can just do this if it's a cube, I think. And it runs it, and it created this awesome letter that again you can send to your boss. It's really shitty in pages, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but in Word, and in, even in the preview, it's kind of okay. <laughs> and so I'm just thinking if you wanted to fix this, it kind of looks like you probably want to do column lists. So you would probably, instead of simple table, you would like whatever it's called, table, I think, and then provide some column lists. It would already look a lot better. Um, yeah, so that's the, the kind of um, a use case, I guess, so few fewer people know about it. Um, that you can generate, yeah. I mean, the, the great thing is you can not only go to work, but of course, once you have the document, it's all, all, all the uh, performance. And the thing is that, um, Instead of, um, so yeah, here you, as a panda filter, you can put in kind of an arbitrary program. There are also Python libraries of things. Um, the kind of, so you don't have to deal with this easier writing and JSON stuff yourself. Um, and they are quite up to date. And that's also a reason um, why changing the ASD is such a breaking thing because you might break other people's standard filters, which is kind of the thing we try to avoid. Because
because there are quite a few out there right now. And so that's also the reason why changes to the standard ASD have been so slow. And a more recent development is that um, some, I'm actually not sure who started it, but people started writing kind of filters in Lua, which is a scripting language, uh, somewhat similar to Python, I'd say. A lot smaller community, of course, but other than that, yeah, Python people are going to trash me now. <laughs> That's kind of my impression as well. Um, and then some time, so um, I think it was Albert, um, who, who was at Zurich Tech uh, um, recently as well, for those who have met him, uh, Albert Jankiewicz, um, implemented this that instead of dash dash filter, you can write dash dash Lua filter and pass in a file. And you won't even need a Lua runtime installed on your system because end of chips with one now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of the same that yeah, every project that's large enough at some point needs to <laughs> or is rewritten in a um, in a statically typed language, and if it grows even larger, then the chips is a Lua runtime. <laughs> yeah, what can we say? But the nice thing is that the filters are really portable, so kind of a downside with some filters if we're going to share it with your friends that don't have THC or anything called Run has to install, or Cabal, like you can do Cabal install, right? If you have Cabal installed, <laughs> and so that's sometimes kind of a drawback to adoption of filters that sometimes do really simple things like five lines of code that you transform your diff for spam. Um, but if you do it in a Lua filter, then you can just chip it, and everyone who has installed them will just profit from it. So that's kind of nice. So, yeah, I guess that concludes kind of the most. I wanted to say. And yeah, you can ask me questions, you can look at the code examples.
it actually does a whole lot of amazing stuff that I don't even know. It also makes it interesting because yeah, the in-performance and out-performance are quite diverse. And very often, like, we, we don't even kind of know what's the best way to represent something in an input or out of performance. And, but to, then someone comes along and is like, wouldn't it be nice if kind of would output this? That would make sense for this output form. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense. Um, ah, yeah, maybe. Someone's still coming off in there. And the nice thing with Malta, as I mentioned, is that it's quite human readable. One of the bad things until recently is that there were, or still are, a lot of different flavors. I think the first Malta implementation was um, the old script, if I'm not mistaken, by John Gruber, who is a blogger. Um, and people kind of liked the, the, the spirit of Malta and the language, but they didn't like this curl tool, so it, they started implementing it in everyone in the operating language. And of course, everyone is a bit differently. And one of those implementations is Pandoc, of course, that's why we have Pandoc flavored Morgan. <laughs> and the, the, the interesting story is that at one point, um, I think it was Stack Overflow and GitHub, um, the, I don't know how it actually um, got into me, but they somehow asked John McFarlane, couldn't you kind of as an in, like as an impartial guy um, unify this, this markdown as and implement the spec? And he was, I don't know, like how long it took him, but he was sure. <laughs> and he came up with the common mark spec and Common mark is kind of the pen, had a markdown flavor that's standardized somewhat, and it's kind of just a subset of markdown. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't include a lot of the fancy stuff that kind of flavored markdown does, but at least it kind of standardizes basic things like, um, like yeah, like it is like indentation, like. Well, what should the output of this be? Is this fine or is it like, um, is it a nested list? So there exactly is here. <laughs> it's really nice human readable thing, but yeah, notoriously difficult implementations to agree on indentation um, and a lot of other edge cases. And so he implemented a JavaScript library and a, a C library even, which GitHub uses now in production to parse markdown. And at some point, that the Pandoc reader will follow suit, and he started implementing a new um, standalone um, common mark compliant Haskell markdown parser, which will be rolled into Pandoc at some point. But for the time being, you can use like from common mark, and this is called the C library that they implemented. And you can also do common mark. And you will lose a few features, but at least it will be consistent. Yeah. But I thought GitHub had also GitHub flavored markdown that was not the same as common mark. Well, as a flag for that. No, I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but since you said that um, and GitHub and Stack Overflow yes, so initiated common mark. They, they, they closely collaborated with Anton McFarlane and GitHub flavored mark John. They forked the common mark C project and added some extensions. Um, yes. <laughs> Which was actually kind of the way it was intended to be. Kind of I think he wrote the C code base in a way to kind of make it extendable because he knew that GitHub system needs a few more features. Like tables, I think. Uh, uh, tables are not in common mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very restrictive. Um, 
mainly yes to focus kind of the weirdness that's already in the in the subset <laughs> in the very very basic subset. Yeah, I mean if you, if you look at the standard manual, um, there is a section about standards more than, and there are a lot of interesting things in there. For example, there are so many different ways to do <laughs> tables. <laughs> and you can turn those things off with extensions. Like here, you do. You cannot use, probably you cannot, at least I'm sure you <laughs> cannot do common mouth plus root tables that will work. Well, it should fail. Maybe that's not checked. That's bad, I guess. But what actually will work is, yeah, from Martin, and like this, you would turn off the extension and like this, turn it on. If, if it's not enabled by default. And maybe one, one recent addition, like it's not so recent that you might not know about or give some stamps, which was a long discussion as well. Uh, like, uh, and it's enabled by default, the fence gives extension. And this is the syntax for in pen dot flavored markdown for diffs. This is an opening diff. And this is the standard um, attribute block that you might also have on, on headers, like um, on headers you can do like my ID, my class, and lots of crazy stuff, and in HTML it will pass, just pass it through. But if you want to see the intermediate representation, then, ah, this is Haskell, we know this. Um, then you can, it's very useful to debug stuff and to, to write your own filters. And then, um, yeah. So you can just pick it. It's not the, the worst syntax, I think it's actually the best. So yeah, you can um, also demonstrate the stand. It's kind of the image syntax is like okay, quick, quick, quick markdown and primer. So this is a link to somewhere you can put something in there. And this for better or worse is like um, an image. And so, kind of the obvious thing that was kind of fairly uncontested was what should the span be, right? Um, so, and you can put like what kind of what you would expect in there. Um, yeah, be because I clearly can expand on this, so you can also. References and this actually demonstrates another feature. If you have an image in, in, in a paragraph without any other content, then it will convert it to a figure, which is usually quite useful, sometimes surprising. Um, and later, figures are kind of useful as well. Three or more. <laughs> and yeah, the, the, the trading columns are kind of optional as well. <laughs> and so yeah, yeah, you can either kind of choose 
just put a class in there or use the attribute block, which is less human readable, but got more yeah, style. And we can nest them. And I think the rule is the nested ones with the fewer colors. And, and, and yeah, so, so the inspiration I think was kind of um, pens, code blocks. I think that's what it's called, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This will actually have source code highlighting, which is quite nice if you do the S flag. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, I think this was picked up by other Markdown implementations, and I guess it's kind of the same here in three or more. Yeah, anyway, in this common mark helper project that John is working on, I think he has that use case in mind and he's um, fixing that somehow. I think he's also putting kind of source annotations in there so we can get better error messages. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not too up to date on that. So the current answer is no. So you can kind of toggle a lot of those extensions on, you can toggle those on the input reader and on the output writer and so you can kind of get quite far if you toggle them on the, on the output writer to kind of adjust the, the, the markdown but you know, it does not and with other formats like for example with Lopix if I want to write a filter which will replace some parts of text is there a good chance that the output of X will look the same as the input one? After five filters? So look the same in I terms mean, of uh, what it looks like in your if, 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 if you change, let's say, one word and using a filter and the whole document, would it be yeah. except this thing, but the variance would be the same? Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if the original docx was generated by a markdown, then a right hand of that should be fairly the same, like, yeah, it should be exactly the same, I think. But let's say 90% of the case, 99. <coughs> if the original docx was generated by Word, then you might lose quite a few things, just as you always do. Like in Word, you can do so many crazy things that are not representable in the standard ASD. But if, if you in use in Word, use those um, like actually actually headers, and if you have these features, select text and say this is a header, instead of just making it bold and increasing the font size, <laughs> then it will actually be converted to in the standard ASD to a proper header and will be output in Word again as a header of the same level. And then it works very well. Okay, there are no more questions. Thanks again.